Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, it means everything to us. We thank you today, Father, for all that Jesus did for us. We thank you today, Father, for all that Jesus does for us and all that he will do for us in the future. Father, today it is our privilege to stand on you, our solid rock. Father, we come into your presence today and and we beg you, dear Lord, speak to us today. Father, today may we orient our lives around Jesus and the cross. May we find our priority in Jesus. Father, be with us today as you always are. Lead us today as you always do. Father, may we follow you wherever you lead. All God's people said, Amen. You may be seated this morning as you turn in your copy of God's Word to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus, and we have hope even in 2020, right? And we need hope in 2020 as we need hope every year, but I don't know, there's just something about this year that maybe we need hope a little bit more in this year. Well, if you're looking for hope, you've come to the right place, because look at the title of this message. The title of this message today from John chapter 20 is, Do a New Thing. And how many of you are ready for a new thing about right now? I think we all are. We might, take a, we might take the express bus to 2021 if we could right now. But uh, God is desiring to do a new thing in our midst, and we're looking towards that. And I want you to know that not only is this title relevant for today, but I had this message um, really pretty much already complete even before there was Mar- Hurricane Marco Polo or whatever it is in the Gulf. I had this all pretty much done, so... Uh, It's not only uh, timely uh, and relevant, but it's something that the Lord led me to. We have been asking the question in this message series, as we live in 2020 and as we walk in these difficult, challenging days together, now what? How are we as the people of God to respond to these difficult days? How are we as the people of God to live in this hour? And, And we found Listen, there's no shortage of Scripture passages to speak to days like the ones that we're living in today. And we found numerous Scripture passages that uh, give us leadership and guidance for these days. And John chapter 20 is is no exception, the message that we will look at today. Uh, And I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. I really wanted to read a larger, I wanted to go back further than verse 11, but the Scripture passage is fairly large already. So let let me set the stage a little bit for you before I begin reading in John chapter 20, verse 11. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead in John chapter 20. And, and of course, that's wonderful and awesome, and it establishes Jesus as the only one to defeat uh, death and sin and the grave, and he's alive. And, of course, Jesus is very much with that program, but the disciples and Mary and Thomas, they're not really with the resurrected Christ program yet because they don't really know about the resurrection and, and they certainly have not wrapped their minds around the resurrected Christ and what that means for them in their lives. So they're a bit confused, scratching their heads still. Let's pick it up. John chapter 20, verse 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she beheld two angels in white sitting, one at the head, one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been laid. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around, and behold, Jesus standing there. And and she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. Verse 19, When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I shall see his hands and the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it in my side and be not unbelieving but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord... And my God. Certainly on that resurrection day, as Jesus rose from the grave, he was leading his disciples and Mary and Thomas to do a new thing. And as we think about these times in which we live and the story recorded in John chapter 20, I think it's important for us to commit to ourselves and to commit to the Lord that we are not going to get stuck in this life quake. Don't get stuck in the life quake. Today, for the first time in over 50 years, I think really for the first time since World War II, the entire planet is going through a challenging, difficult time all at the same time. One columnist recently wrote, I learned that massive life disruptions, or life quakes as I call them, strike people in the core of their being. Listen to this. He said they create meaning vacuums in which we feel frightened, overwhelmed, and stuck. That columnist really sort of poignantly captured the moment in which we live by calling them life quakes and talking about uh, the fear and the sense of being overwhelmed and, and the position that many people find themselves in today, that of being stuck. He captured that poignantly. I, I don't really think he did very well at prescribing the solutions to the problem, but he certainly captured the problem and painted the picture well. We're living in a life quake zone today, and, and people are struck at the core of their being. And there is most definitely today in this moment a meaning vacuum in which uh, there are many people who are frightened and overwhelmed and stuck. But the good news is, and the purpose of this message series is to lead us to understand that we have a guide. We have a way maker. We have the truth. We have our own copy of the truth. And we have an anchor for our souls. We have a solid rock upon which to stand in a solid rock upon which to live our lives. We don't have to be shaken. We might be perplexed and frustrated, but we don't have to be shaken. When you look at John chapter 20, you see that the disciples of Christ at this moment in their walk with the Lord, they certainly found themselves in the midst of a life quake. There's Mary. She was standing outside Jesus' tomb weeping, if you look at the scripture there, you'll find that she was weeping, not because she was just sad. She was not weeping because she understood the resurrection. She was weeping because she thought someone had stolen Jesus' body. She didn't know where he was. 
And she was standing outside of Jesus' tomb weeping, convinced that she was alone in her condition, doubting, no doubt, the continuation of her faith. Mary certainly was experiencing a life quake, and she demonstrated that by her tears. Meanwhile, over at the home office, you would expect things to be better at the home office, right? Well, not only were they not better, they were probably worse. The home office is reflected in verse 19. Look at what the disciples were doing. The disciples had gone into the room, cowered together, shut the door and locked it, and were afraid. Experiencing their own life quake. Demonstrated by their fear. The disciples were there in that room quarantined. Doubting uh, the reality and the truthfulness of their experience with Jesus. Asking themselves, as many are asking themselves today, now what? What do we do now? Saying things in their spirits and in their hearts like, did all of that really just happen? Was Jesus really crucified? Did we actually bury the king of kings? Is he dead And so it is that this life quake in the lives of the followers of Jesus brought tears and fears and doubts, which we will look at in more detail in a moment. And that led to an overwhelming sense of bewilderment and disorientation about the very plan of God. What about all the things that Jesus said? What about all the things that Jesus did? What about all of the promises that he made to us and to others. What about the hope? Where's the hope? Did the hope die with Jesus? Was God doing anything in that day? This is no doubt the kinds of questions that Mary and the disciples and Thomas were asking. God, what are you doing? I don't understand. Was God doing anything or was that just the saddest, darkest, bleakest, gloomiest day in the history of the universe? On this side of the cross in 2020, looking back at that time, you say, are you kidding? Was God doing something in that day? What do you mean? Was God doing something with the... Death and burial and resurrection of Christ. God was doing everything in that day. We have the benefit of hindsight. And we see back to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus very clearly. We can see it. And church, one day, we'll be looking back on these days with hindsight. We'll be looking back on these hours with 2020 vision and we will see clearly that God is doing something in these days. God is moving in these hours because God is always doing something and God is always moving and God is always leading and God is always present and God is always here until we have 2020 hindsight on these days though. Here it is. Here it is church. Listen. God moves even when we are in a life quake. God moves even when you are in the middle of a life quake. And and if I may be even a little bit more bold and say this, sometimes God moves more forcefully and powerfully in your life quakes than he does at any other time. Because it is in the life quakes that we naturally turn to Him. It is in the challenges and difficulties of life that we naturally look to Him for leadership and guidance. Is God moving? Absolutely, God is moving. God moves even in our tears and our fears and our doubts. So then, what in the world was God doing? Leading His children to this kind of life quake in John chapter 20. Better yet, what in the world was God doing leaving his children in that kind of life quake? Because I think that's our real fear today. Our real fear is not necessarily that we've been led into a difficult time. Our real fear is not 
necessarily that we've been led into a challenging time. Our real fear is that God's going to leave us here. We're not necessarily scared of the challenge and the difficulty. After all, we are Louisianians. I saw yesterday on Facebook, somebody said, I'm, I'm really not that afraid of the hurricane. I'm much more afraid of five days with no air conditioning. <laughs> to which I say, amen. That's exactly right. Our real fear is not the difficulty of the day, the challenge of the day. Our real fear is that God's going to leave us here. And I think that's what was running through the minds and the hearts and the spirits of Mary and the disciples and Thomas. What is God's purpose in life claims? If we don't want to get stuck in those challenging moments, we need to understand God's purpose in these difficult, challenging times. What is God's purpose in sending life quakes and in, in leading us through life quakes? Well, I don't think I can say it any better than Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 says, Do not fear. Ah, that's number one. John 14, 6, when Jesus was talking about his impending death, to his disciples, he said, fear not. Do not fear. God says, Isaiah 43, for I have redeemed you. If God has redeemed you, you don't need to fear anything. There's no reason to fear anything at all, as we say in the South. I have called you by your name. God has called you by your name. He knows your name. He knows your lot in life. He knows your position. He knows your tears and your fears and your doubts. I have called you by your name. You are mine. I will be with you when you pass through the waters. When you pass through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. You will not be scorched when you walk through the fire. And the flame will not burn you. We looked at that passage of scripture last week. But look here at 4319. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers, in the desert. Do you see it, church? There it is. What is God doing in the life quakes? What is God doing in your life quakes? In times of tear, tears and fears and doubts, he's doing something new. He is doing something new. And certainly, at this moment in the life of Mary and the disciples and Thomas, God was doing everything new. A new way for us to relate to our Creator. A new covenant. God wants to do something new. In these days, God wants to do something new. In the midst of these quakes, God wants to do something new. In Isaiah's time, listen, the new thing was afar off. It was way off. It was out there in the distance someday. In Isaiah's time, the new thing was just a promise, a glimmer of hope out there in the future, a promise for a coming Messiah, a promise for salvation. In Mary and the disciples' time, Thomas's time, that new thing was revolutionary. It was about Mary and the disciples and Thomas becoming the body of Christ. It was about him ascending back to the right hand of the Father and them becoming his body on earth. Where they would do the same things that Jesus did while he was here. Proclaim Christ, proclaim salvation. Jesus appeared in the midst of his people. To Mary, who was in tears, he said, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Here I am. To the disciples, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. There's the new thing that Jesus was doing in the hearts and lives of his followers in John chapter 20. As I have been sent here, as the Father has sent me, that's not new. Jesus had been here. But I also send you, that's the word apostle, it's right there. I'm making you my apostles. That's new. And that's 
awesome and incredible and earth-shattering. Jesus led his disciples to something new. He said to his, his disciples, in essence, listen, we have the same mission as Jesus to seek and to save that which is lost. We have the same message as Jesus, repent and believe in the gospel. We have the same method as Jesus, preaching and teaching and ministering. We have the same motive as Jesus, loving all people. We have the same muscle as Jesus, the authority of God himself. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now you go, go, go. Spread the gospel. Share the good news. He said to his disciples who were afraid and locked in that room, quarantined there, receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Receive the Holy Spirit and proclaim the forgiveness of sins through the body and blood of Christ. Today, in our time, and in our life quake, the new thing that God wants to do is the same as it was for Mary and the disciples. Receive the peace of Christ. Receive the Holy Spirit. Share the forgiveness. Walk with Jesus. Become like Him. Be in Him as He is in us. Today, in our time, the new things that God wants to do in you, listen, the new thing God wants to do in you, it's always, always, always about Jesus. The new thing He wants to do in you is about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Christ. The new thing that God wants to do in our midst is about Jesus. The new thing that God wants to do in our nation is about Jesus. The new thing that God wants to do in our world is about Jesus. You say, well, Jesus is not new. Well, he's new to us. He's new to the billions of people that don't know him. Jesus is always new and fresh. There are always new ways to live in Him. There are always new steps of faith to take in Him. There are always new ways to know Him. There are always new ways to be more like Him. Jesus is never old. And if He seems old to us, if He seems stale to us, it's because our walk with Him has become old. And our walk with Him has become old. Stale, And our walk with him has become plateaued. And as he leads us to new things, the question that rings out is, will we let him? Will we let him do something new in our hearts and lives? Will we let him lead us to a new place? Will we let him lead us to a new level of faith? The real question is not, is God going to leave us in this life quake? The answer is no. He's not going to leave us in this life quake. That's not the question. The real question is not, is God doing something in this day? Is God alive? Is he speaking? Is he leading? That's not the real question. The real question is, will we let him? And when you look at the believers who are here in these verses, in all of their lives, there's this progression from disorientation and confusion, and tears, and fears, and doubt, to recognition of Jesus, to new faith, to new commitment. Think about the disorientation. 
initially. There it is in Mary. She's in tears. There it is in the case of the disciples. They are in fear. There it is in the case of Thomas. And we haven't said too much about him, but we'll focus on him underneath this last point. In the case of, in the case of Thomas, the disorientation is doubt. And then there is the recognition. Mary recognizes Jesus and she says, Rabboni, teach her. I see you. The disciples, verse 20 says, they rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They saw him. The resurrected Christ. Thomas is perhaps the most interesting case. And I wanted to look at his whole case study here. Initially, Thomas was not in on the first meeting with Jesus in that locked room. He wasn't there. And so initially, Thomas said, no, nah, not going not gonna to be a part of that. Not going to do it. The answer is no. Thomas missed the first meeting with Christ. And you know how it is when you miss the first meeting, right? You're not with a program when you miss the first meeting. When you miss an initial meeting about a new program or you miss an orientation meeting, you're just not with the program. Now, if you miss a meeting in the Baptist world, they'll elect you chairperson of the committee. (laughs) But it's not that way in the rest of the world. If you miss a meeting in the rest of the world, you're just not with the program. Thomas was not with the program. He was the lone holdout. There's, There's that person in every office. There's that person in every classroom. There's that person in every family. They're the holdout. The last remaining one standing out there. The odd person out. And Thomas said, hmm, I'm not doing anything until I have proof. I'm not doing anything until I know. Until Jesus himself shows up. I shall not be moved. I'll not do one new thing. Now think about this. For eight days, Thomas was stuck in the life quake. The other disciples were wrapping their minds around the resurrected Christ. They're wrapping their minds around, you know, I also send you. They're wrapping their minds around... The apostle idea, we're apostles. But for eight days, Thomas is stuck in the life quake. For eight days, Thomas remained in the doubt. For eight days and seven nights, Thomas went on living his life as if Jesus was dead. For eight days and seven nights, Thomas went on living his life as if there had been no resurrection, as if it was all over. There's that person. They're always there. How does Jesus deal with that person? He left the 99 and he went for the one. In John chapter 20, he holds another meeting and comes back for a second time just for Thomas. Just for the doubter. comes into the room again and he says peace be with you and he looks at Thomas and he says reach here your finger see my hands reach here your hand and put it in my side and be not unbelieving but believing respond in faith do the new thing that I'm calling you and leading you to do. And Thomas, doubter though he was, and Thomas, suspicious though he may have been, had a greater moment of recognition than I think all of the other disciples and Mary combined. You know, I guess the longer they hold out, the bigger they fall, you know. The bigger they are, the bigger they fall. And Thomas has an incredible moment of recognition. 
And he says, my Lord and my God. Why does God use life quakes? To get us to the other side of our doubt? To break our self-will, perhaps? To mature us? Interesting that Mary called him teacher because he was teaching her that day. Teaching all of us. God uses life quakes to do something new and, and to bring us specifically to those crystal clear moments of recognition where we finally see it and say, my Lord and my God, yes, I'll go. My Lord and my God, yes, I'll surrender. My Lord and my God, yes, I'll do it. What new thing is God trying to do in your life today? Whatever it is, it's tied to Jesus. Whatever it is, Jesus is right in the middle of it. Whatever it is, don't miss it. Spend some extra time if you need to. Cry if you need to. Be fearful if you need to. Doubt a little bit even if you need to, but don't miss it. Come to that moment where you say, my Lord and my God. 2 Corinthians 5.17, I'll close with this, says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. And I don't know about you, but I think that's a process. I think we are in process of becoming new creatures all the time. We are being renewed all the time. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. All of that begins with making Jesus the Lord of your life. All of that begins with a commitment of faith to him. Turning to him and saying, my Lord and my God. Would you stand with me as we pray together today? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who makes all things new and brings new things. Father, how we need new things in our world today. Father, help us to be faithful messengers of the new life that Jesus gives. Father, thank you for sending us just as you sent Jesus. Father, you are our Lord and our God. You are our master and our king. Strengthen us and empower us as we leave here with the Holy Spirit to be your witnesses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as always, if you need to talk to any staff member about new life that can be yours through the Lord Jesus Christ or any issue, you can text us at that phone number, we'd be more than willing to talk with you and help you in any way that we can. You can exit out the front doors. There are offering plates at the doors for your tithes and